I'm shocked. I can't believe it. I mean, how could you? How do you feel right now? That is how Paul began his letter in the book of Galatians. All right, turn your Bibles to Galatians chapter 1. You're like, what did I do? How many times have you walked into the house, maybe you're a kid or maybe you're your spouse, and, and all of a sudden there's a response of like, I can't believe you just did. And you're like, what did I just do? Right? Th- this is the, there's, a, there's, a, there's an awareness, there's an energy that Paul is bringing in this letter. Paul begins, verse 6, I am astonished. Now, when you look at all of Paul's other letters that he wrote in the New Testament, they all have the, pretty much the same format. There's an introduction. I am Paul, an apostle or a servant of, of Jesus Christ, and grace and peace to you. And, I, and then after the introduction, there's always a, I thank God for you, and this is the things I'm so grateful for you about. There's no thanksgiving in this letter. Think about it. There's nothing he's thanking them. He's not, he's not thanking God for anything going on. Paul goes right into the meat of what's wrong. And he's doing this because there is a major problem going on. There's a major issue that this church is dealing with. And as we introduced last week, and as Jason described a little bit this morning, this is a church that Paul has planted on his first missionary journey. And as he has went away, there's been a, there's been a, a rumbling, there's a people behind him that have been teaching another teaching or adding to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The message that Jesus or that, that Paul came to this church saying, listen, God loves you. He sent his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross for your sins, to save you from an eternity of hell, and to bring you into a personal relationship with him. That is the message that Paul brings, this, this announcement of, of good news, the gospel. And what they're doing is they're turning away from it. There's a group of people coming in. They're called the Judaizers. And they are saying, well, listen, Paul, yeah, he, he told you a little bit about Jesus, but he didn't tell you the full story of God. If you want to be the people of God, you've got to adopt all the things that God started from the very beginning when he called Abraham to be his, you know, a special people. And yeah, you can come in and be a part of this. You can accept Jesus as Messiah like we are, but you also have to abide by the rules and the laws and the festivals that are in the Old Testament. Because if you don't, you're not really following God. And so these people are like, well, what do we do? And so a lot of them are adopting this message, this philosophy of it's Jesus plus the law that equals salvation. And so Paul is writing and he's saying, listen, I, I am astonished. He's bringing a level, this is a level five emotional response to what's going on. And he is wanting people to, he wants the, the recipients to feel this tension, to feel this, whoa, this is a big deal. What, what Paul is talking about here is pretty serious stuff. You see, what we've got to learn today is that with, you know, a lot of times when we go to different churches, they're all different denominations now, and there's all different kind of variations of, of Christian sects. But you know, one of the things that I think in our, in our common experience is we look at a lot of the differences as, well, that's just kind of like flavors of ice cream. Like this person likes this thing, or this person likes this church, or this person likes this denomination. But what we've got to remember is there was no denominations back then. And one of the things that that Paul's making very clear is that there's only one gospel. Look again what he says in verse 6. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you into the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Look at this. Not that there is another one. There's only one gospel that Paul's saying. All the things that are going on, all these different messages you're hearing, this, con- this confusion that's going on today, I want you to understand something. There's only one good news. Now that word good news is a, is a really important word because that, that word gospel, when we th- hear the word gospel, we typically think it because of our Christian experience, we think of, well, that's when you tell someone about Jesus. But the, the word gospel is a, is a, in the Greek word, is euangelion. Whenever you see in the Greek an EU prefix attached to a, a word, it's a, it's a descriptor of good, okay? And then angelion, or angel, or angelos is messenger, angelion is news or message. 
And so good message, good news. And when, when good news, when, and when this was used in, in Greek and Roman times, this was used in the context of a couple different scenarios. For example, uh, one would be you would, you would announce a euangelion when someone was about to get married. I think that makes sense. It's, it's good news. Another time that this would be used is in, in the political realm. It would be used to describe um, when an emperor came to, to, uh, to, to authority, when he rose to the throne and he accepted this position as authority. If there's a new king, this is good news, euangelion. Now, here's the thing that's different between how Paul uses this and how the New Testament writers use this word, euangelion, and how the other author, or how it was used in, in that day. Because most of the time when euangelion was used in, in context outside of the Bible, it was in the plural, okay? Um, and what the, when the New Testament and biblical writers use this word, it's in the singular, what they're saying is there is only one good news. There's an ultimate good news. There's a good news that's better than any other good news, and it's, not a, it's bigger than any emperor being announced. There is a true king, not over just over the Roman Empire, but over the entire world. And so what they were announcing was something big, something earth-shattering, something that will, will transform not just your life, but the entire world. And that's what Paul is saying. There's only one gospel. Now, when we hear that today, boy, that, that's not an easy message to receive. You see, we live in, in the, the common cultural ideals that you and I are used to, 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 to living in and, and the cultural societal norms. When we say something that is exclusive, it's not viewed upon as a good message, is it? You know, one of the words, you know, how many of you ever heard the word zeitgeist? Ever, any of you ever hear the word zeitgeist? Well, or some of you have. Um, zeitgeist is a German word that means spirit of the age. Spirit of the age. Well, what's the, what's the zeitgeist of today? In today's zeitgeist of our, of our current common American context, it's this. That everyone is right. You, you do you, and I'll do me. And if you disagree with me, or if you tell me that I'm wrong, you hate me. That, that's what people believe. If you tell me what I'm doing is wrong, or if you tell me that, I, that, that, that I, what I believe is wrong, then you really don't love me. Love equals acceptance. Right? These are all cultural. As I'm saying this, you guys are like, you get that, right? This is what people teach. This is what people believe. And so when you say something exclusive that, hey, there's, there's only one gospel. It's something we've got to confront in our own spirits, in our own hearts, to say, hey, is there really own one, only one gospel? Or is there other gospel? It, and so we have the spirit of the age, of the, the waters we're all swimming in, that people are saying, hey, listen, no, there's, there's this idea that, hey, we're all just, God's at the top of the pyramid, and all of us are kind of just reaching God on our own. And it's, it's, that's just, that's, isn't that a nice thought? That we're all we're all going to be in heaven one day, and you know you do that thing, and God's just at the top of the pyramid. And he's like, I just love the Muslims doing their thing, and I I love the Hindus doing their thing, and and I love the Christians. I just love everything. Just, just it's all good. No, that's not right. It's not true, and I know that might be the common way of looking at religion and looking at faiths and looking at truth, but it's not the reality of what the Word of God teaches. The Word of God teaches something drastically different. It teaches that there's only one message. There's only one good news. And not only do we have the cultural issues going on today, we also have issues even within the, the church. Because even within the church, the gospel is being corrupted. The God, you know, whenever you add a, be, be very careful by adding an adjective in front of the word gospel. There's a reason why we have pure gospel before the series. Because there are other kinds of gospels that really aren't gospels. For example, have you heard of the term prosperity gospel? Right? Prosperity gospel is this idea of Jesus plus the American dream equals salvation. 
that Jesus came to die not to set me free from sin. So maybe he did that. But the most important thing is Jesus came to die to give you the life you always wanted, your best life now, to have the car of your dreams, the, 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 as much money as you could possibly want. That's why Jesus came to die, to set you free to live that life. No, that's a perversion of the gospel. It's not the gospel. Maybe, how many of you have heard the social gospel? The social gospel is essentially Jesus came to die. It's Jesus plus Marxism. That Jesus came to die not to set you free from sins, but to set you free from the oppressive powers in your life. Now, here's, here's, when I share all that, here's the reality. That as Christians, there, there should be a byproduct of our faith. For example, the byproduct of our faith should be that we are wiser with our resources, our money, that, we, that, that we're asking God to bless us. And if we are doing things the way God teaches us in his word, the chances of us being more financially blessed are very high. It doesn't mean it's always guaranteed, but, but the principles outlined in scripture teach us these kinds of things. But it's a byproduct, not a prime product. And should society change? Should there be things in our life? Should there be things in society that change drastically because we as Christians are living out our faith? Absolutely. That was very true in first century, uh, you know, Roman Roman uh, Roman Empire. You know, the way that they changed society drastically because of the Christian faith. But it was a byproduct, but and not a prime product. And so, even within the church, we've got to come to the grips of there's only one gospel. We can't form it into being something that makes us feel good or makes, makes other people feel good. We have to conform what the true gospel is to what God says. And so one of the things that, that I'm hoping that the two big problems I think that all of us have in this room this morning will fit into two camps. Because when I realize there's only one gospel, there's two major issues that we've got to confront. Number one, the first one is this. Do you and I have the convictions that there's only one gospel? Right, you might be sitting here. I'm not going to assume that just because you're in the room here at church that you really believe what the Bible teaches about the, the genuineness and that there's only one way to heaven through Jesus Christ. So that's that's the first thing that I think if you don't have that settled, that was something that you need to think through. Number two is this, and that is courage. You know, you might be sitting here and be like, Yeah, Ben, there's only one way, there's only one way, and I can sing it and I'm excited, but when you go out there. And when you go to school, and when you go into your neighborhoods, and you, you're around certain groups of friends, what do you do in those moments when a false gospel is presented to people? When lies are taught, what do you do in those moments? See, we need to have, we need, to, we need Christians today, we need that Christians that have character, that have the courage and the convictions to say, I know what the one true gospel is, and I know how to share it. Remember those, four, remember those five questions I shared at last, last week? Five questions were, do you understand the gospel? Do you believe the gospel? Can you articulate the gospel? Can you defend the gospel? And how is the gospel changing your life? Well, to me, this sermon, this, these five verses that we're going to be reading about today deal with, I believe, giving a lot of clarity to that first question, do you understand it? And the, and the fourth question, can you defend it? Because we need people today, we need followers of Jesus today that will defend the true gospel of Jesus Christ. So what does Paul say? How do, how do we do this? Well, well let's, let's again look at verse, let's read the, the text, verses 6 through 9. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Circle that word different, okay? Paul's going to give some descriptive words of what's going on here. Circle that word different. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. Circle that word distort, all right? Even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so I say it now again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one who you received, let him be accursed. Circle that word contrary. Contrary. So, so Paul is using three different terms to describe what's going on here. And he wants them to understand the significance of what's going on. He's saying they taught you a different gospel. But the gospel, you know, again, 
this is not just a variation of something. This is not just something that's like, well, that's his opinion, and this is Paul's opinion, but we all can live happily together. Paul's like, no. Because the different gospel isn't a gospel. That different gospel distorts the one true gospel. And because it distorts the one true gospel, guess what it is? It is a gospel contrary to the true gospel. See, what we've got to understand is there are, there are many ingredients that, that are required for us to believe in the one true gospel. Um, it's kind of like chocolate chip cookies. How many of you love chocolate chip cookies? I mean, my, my wife has the best chocolate chip peanut butter oatmeal cookies. I mean, they're awesome. They're amazing. Um, but, you know, you all basically need five basic ingredients to make chocolate chip cookies. You need flour. You need sugar. You need butter. You need eggs. And what do you need? Chocolate chips. And you, all five of those got to be there or something's not turning out right. Now, I remember a number of years ago, we went on a missions trip over to Berlin, Germany. We were working with this, uh, this international church, and we took a group from our church over there, and we put on this English camp for the kids in the city. Berlin's a very international city, so you know if you ever go to a city like Berlin, you can get a, as an American, you can get by very easily because almost everyone speaks English. But they had this church put on this English camp to draw kids from the city to teach them English, but also to teach them the Word of God. And so it was one of their big outreaches. And so our church came over to help them put this on. And so in the mornings, it was kids. and the afternoons and evenings, it was teenagers. And so um, during the week, you know, we had a great time, great impact, and, and just enjoyed that missions trip incredibly well. Liz and I went on that. And towards the end of the week, one of these teenage girls brought a a batch of, a, like a little Tupperware thing of chocolate chip cookies. And we're like, oh, this is so nice of you. And so she opens up and she gives us all the cookies and we take a bite. And there's something wrong with this cookie. <laughs> really wrong with this cookie because it looks amazing. But we take a bite and we start chewing. We start looking at each other like, hmm. What? I, what the only thing I can deduce is that the girl who made these cookies mixed up sugar with baking powder. And so I was eating a baking powder biscuit. And it was, it was I mean, to just have one bite of that was re <laughs> really hard. And I remember all of us were like, that's so good, I'm saving that for later. You know, it, it was just one of those things, what can you do in that moment? But if you don't put sugar in the recipe, it's not a cookie right? You take out one ingredient from the one true gospel, and it's not the gospel anymore. I want to show you a screen or a slide up here on the screen. And uh, these five elements have to, be, have to be present when it comes to the one true gospel. These five elements are the nature of God, the nature of man, the nature of Jesus, the nature of Jesus' death and resurrection, and the nature of faith. All, you've, got to, you've got to hit all five of these on the bullseye of what the Bible teaches if you are going to say that's the gospel. For example, the nature of God. You, you can't just have, well, God is just so loving and kind and gracious and compassionate, but he doesn't really care. He doesn't really care about your sin. Or God's just really mean judgment. I mean, he just, he just can't wait to zap you and send you to hell. Like, you've got to have both the, the mercy and the compassion and the grace and the goodness of God with his justice. Both of those are the full reflection and the nature and character of God. If you take away one, you miss the gospel. The nature of man. You've got to understand the Bible teaches that even though we are created in the image of God to reflect God's image, we have sinned. We have rebelled against God. Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Any religion, any faith, any philosophy that says, you know, men, we've got weaknesses, we've got issues, but we are basically good. That, that's not the gospel. The nature of Jesus. Either G Jesus is, the, the, what's the right one? Jesus is fully God and fully man. That anything that diminishes either the deity of Jesus or diminishes the humanity of Jesus, you don't have the gospel. Because you need a human representative to, to, to stand before God to pay the penalty for humanity. And you need God who's able, you need the fullness of deity to overcome the curse of sin and death. You need both in order for the gospel to be true. You, you have to get the nature of Jesus' death and resurrection right. That Jesus died for our sins. 
He didn't die as a moral example. He didn't die because he was trying to align with our suffering and to feel what suffering felt like. No, when he went to the cross, he went to the cross because you're a sinner and I'm a sinner. And someone had to pay the penalty for sins. If you diminish the work of the atonement of Jesus Christ, you don't get the gospel. You also have to get the nature of faith right. It is not just mental assent, like I understand mentally the truth. That's, it's more than that. But it's also not faith plus works. It's not, I, I, I believe, but I also have to perform to make sure I'm accepted. That, if you don't get all five of those right, according to the word of God, you don't get the gospel. And so what the, what the Judaizers were doing, if you think about those five things, what were the Judaizers messing up? What were they corrupting in this, on this list? Last two. Because what they believed, even though they said they had nature of God, Check. Nature of man? Check. Nature of Jesus? I believe they believed he was the Messiah. But what they really messed up on was they believed that Jesus' death and resurrection for his atonement was not completely total, that you could trust in it for your salvation. And that corrupted their nature of faith because they said it was faith plus the law. It's faith plus our works that equal our acceptance to God. And I don't care which one of those five things you mess up. There's a lot of different religions and a lot of different faiths and a lot of different philosophies that are out there. But here's what you and I have to come to grips with. You and I have to conform our beliefs, our understanding to the word of God and what the Bible says about those five things if we want to get the gospel right. And if you mess up on any of those, you're wrong. And I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not trying to be intolerant. I'm not trying to, you know, be, be, be uh, offensive. You know, a lot of times we talk about being offensive. Listen, just because you disagree with someone does not mean you're being offensive. The reality, there are times when the truth, the truth offends. We as Christians should never be offensive, though. You know, it's, it's not about, you know, taking these, it's not about us knowing the truth and be like, all right, you're wrong, you're wrong. You know, we're not blowing people away with the truth. Okay, that's not what God wants us to do. What he wants us to do is, is where people differ on these things, right? Lean into that. If people say something, you'll be like, well, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. I was faithful to God, Ben. Pat myself on the back. I told that guy he was an idiot. You're like, no, that's not what we're talking about here. Okay, you can, you can offend someone without being offensive. You know, if someone doesn't believe in, in the word of God, like, or the truth of the gospel with these things, one of the best things to do is be curious. Well, I'm curious, wh- where did you, how did you come to that conclusion? You know, I, I would have to disagree with that according to my study of scripture, but, you know, lean into it. But don't just sit there passively and be like, well, that's what, that's what they want to believe. That's not what God wants us. Because here's the thing that the lie, the lie of, the, of the spirit of the age tells us this. That if you are sincere, that's all that God cares about. That sincerity equals you're okay with God. That's a lie. Because you know, you know who else was really sincere? The Nazis. The Nazis were really sincere. They really believed what they were doing was good and right and true. But they were wrong. And there's, there's a lot of ideologies and there's a lot of philosophies that are just flat out wrong. You know, when you are engaging with people today, what you've got to learn is, is figuring out what is, what is their philosophical presupposition about what they think about when it comes to truth. I, I want to share with you two more words on this slide, two words that you've got to know, because when people, when it comes to the gospel, two fundamental questions you've got to ask someone is this, is that, is Jesus the only way to salvation and is faith required? Is Jesus the only way to salvation and is faith required? Because these two words answer those two questions. The first one is this, pluralism. Pluralism is the belief that there's more than one way to salvation. Remember, it's the God at the top of the pyramid. And it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. And as long as you, you, just, you believe in your own heart that you are just, you've got it. I just, I looked within myself. And I found the truth. That's, that's wrong. There's a lot of words I could say about that. But that's not the right way. 
There's, there's only one way to salvation. Because going back to the previous slide, the reason I can say that the, the simple law of non-contradiction, because different faiths believe different things about the nature of God. Different faiths and religions believe different things about the nature of Jesus, the nature of man, the nature of faith. They all teach different things. And you cannot have contrary beliefs aligning in God saying, it's all, it's all okay. It doesn't work. And that leads to the second word, and that is either inclusivism or universalism. It's the idea that Jesus' blood, and you'll find this within, what I find is pluralism, you'll find out, more outside of the church. But inclusivism and universalism, you'll find inside the church. And this is the idea that Jesus died on the cross, and his blood is sufficient to cover all of mankind's sins, which I believe. But they take it a step farther and say, you know what, because of Jesus' death, it's going to include everyone. Even if no one even accepts Jesus, even no one shows faith or repentance, they, God says, at the end of the day, I've taken care of it. You don't need to worry. Then what's the point of faith now? What is the point of doing anything? With, if, if, if universalism or inclusivism is true, go home, get up from your seat right now, and go home. There's no point in reading and studying or telling anyone about Jesus. There's no point in even living like Jesus because Jesus' death took care of all of it. Just go home and do your own thing. That, if that's true, if universalism or inclusivism is true, that Jesus' death covers everyone for all time and all people and everyone's just going to be in heaven with him someday, and it doesn't really matter what you do, if it doesn't matter if you repent or put your faith in Christ, then why are you here? See, both of these are the zeitgeist of today, both inside the church and outside the church. So what we've got to do is go back to the Word of God. And we don't have the time to look in all of these passages of Scripture. I'm going to give them to you, write them down if you want to look at them later. But John 14, 6 John, this is Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus claims exclusivity. He claims that he is the one by which salvation is found. He says the same thing, John 17, verses 1 and 2. He claims exclusive, exclusive saving authority by what he is about to accomplish on the cross. Luke 24, verse 26, on, and he's... It's a, he's on the road to Emmaus with these two disciples this is after his resurrection. And Jesus says something very profound. He tells them, it was necessary. It was necessary that the Christ should suffer these things. If the cross, if it was not necessary for Jesus to die, why did he do it? Jesus claims the necessity of his death to bring salvation. And then Matthew 28, 18 through 20, after his death and resurrection, what did he say? All authority and heaven and earth has been given to me. I'm in charge of all of it. Any religion, any faith does not put Jesus as Lord and Savior and King at the top is a false religion. It's a false faith. And so Jesus claims exclusivity, and it's not just him. The followers of him claimed exclusivity. In Acts chapter 4, verse 12, the Apostle Peter, when he's preaching this sermon to people that were just watching after they healed this, this blind person, he says, there's no other name under heaven by which anyone can be saved but the name of Jesus. He's claiming exclusivity there. In Romans 3, verses 21 through 26, Paul says, it's, not, you know, it's the culmination of his argument. It's not about your good works. It's not about the law. It's not about who you are, what you've done. If you want to be justified declared righteous before God, you must put your faith and trust in Jesus alone. It's only through him that we can find salvation. And then in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, where Paul says there's only one mediator between God and mankind, and that one mediator is Jesus Christ. And then you have Acts chapter 17, verse 16 through 34. Paul is at the Acropolis. Lots of, I mean, there are faith systems all around him. All kinds of idols, all kinds of worshipers. And what, what does he say? Does he walk in there and be like, I'm so happy that you guys are so spiritual. I'm so happy you guys are religious and you got your cool temple prostitution over here and you got the sacrificing, you know, weird animal. I mean, what does he say? It says his spirit was troubled and he confronts him and says, listen, all of you believing all these false gods, there's a one true God out there that you need to come to. He confronts the religions of his day. 
And if, if the Christian faith, if it was all about inclusivism, Paul would have sat there and just, just been like, good job, guys. Keep it up. That's not what he said, and that's not what he did. The Bible teaches exclusivity. The Bible teaches that there's only one way to salvation through Jesus Christ, and faith in him is required. Now, again, I've spent a lot of time on this point because this is, this is the main point I want to leave us with. But, but, again, Paul's not trying to be ignorant or intolerant or mean. He's actually being quite loving. And the reason I can tell you why he's being loving is because of some of the language he uses. Look at what it says in verses 8 and 9. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. And he says the same thing in verse 9. Again, as we have said before, I say it again. If anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. That word accursed that he says twice for emphasis is the Greek word anathema. That word anathema is, again, this is in my study as I was reading the commentaries, I had to make sure I was getting this right. It would be like us in our vernacular today, it would be Paul saying, I want these people damned to hell. It was a curse upon people that were corrupting the gospel. In fact, this word anathema, when they translated the, the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek, they use this word anathema to describe what, remember two weeks ago we talked about the Canaanite conquest, Deuteronomy 7. They use this word anathema for this term for devote to destruction. That's, what it, that's how heavy this word is. Now, why, is Paul saying this because he's mean? No, he's saying this because he loves these people. And you know this, if you're a mom or you're a dad or you're a grandparent or aunt and uncle, if someone's about to attack your child and someone's about to corrupt them or someone's about to do something to harm them permanently, what would you do to stop them? You would do a lot, would you not? And it's not because you're mean. It's not because you're, you're ugly or intolerant. It's because you love the innocence of your children too much. You love your children too much or your grandchildren too much to see anything bad happen to them. And so you will stand before them and you will, say, you will do some, some kind of, you will, you will do harm to another person to make sure this person is unharmed. That's exactly the spirit that Paul's saying this in. As a, as a fatherly presence in this church, he is saying, I don't want, I want the people that are trying to corrupt you from the gospel, I want them to go to hell. Because if you listen to them, you're going to hell. That's what Paul's saying. And what we've got to understand is this. It is always loving to tell someone the truth. It is always loving to tell, them, tell someone the truth. And it's loving to tell someone that they're wrong when they're wrong. And, and we've got to get over this, the spirit of the age, the zeitgeist that says, hey, listen, let's just you do you and I'll do me. And what's good for you is good for you. What's good for you, like, it's all, it's all, we're all okay. No one's wrong here. That's a lie. And so what we've got to do, the question I want to leave you with is, do you have the courage to stand up when someone is preaching a false gospel? Or will you succumb to the pressure of the zeitgeist of the community? That's number one. Number two, there's only one Savior. There's only one Savior. You know, as I was reading this text this week, you know, when I study for a sermon, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll read the passage over and over and over again and just see what stuff st st sticks out to me. And there'll be things that stick out to me, you know, the, the, the fifth time I've read through something that, you know, different from the first time. But the very first time I read the text this week, this one point stood out to me. Look again in verse six. I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him him. See, Paul could have made the argument, I'm, I'm, I'm astonished, I'm surprised, I'm, my mind is blown away that you are so quickly deserting the message I taught you, that you're so quickly deserting my teaching, you're so quickly deserting the philosophy or the doctrines of the Christian faith. He doesn't say that. He says, I'm, I'm shocked, I'm astonished that you're deserting him, him. See, there's only one Savior. 
There's only one Savior. And one of the things I love about the Christian faith that makes the Christian faith so unique, I remember I talked about the uniqueness of the Christian faith last week in saying that every other faith system in the world teaches that you must perform to be accepted. Christianity teaches that Jesus Christ performed so that you could be accepted. That's the Christian faith. But what else I love about the Christian faith is this. It's not a religion, and it's not a faith system that is merely a creedal doctrinal statement. It is more than that. It is a personal relationship with the God of the universe. That is so unique. Now, now, here's what I want you to understand. You can divo- it's very easy today in, within Christian circles to divorce the creeds of Christianity from the person of Jesus Christ. And when you do that, you know, that happens a lot with churches that go liberal. They're like, I just want Jesus, just Jesus. We don't need a creed. Just Jesus, all love Jesus. We don't care what you believe. We just want to believe in Jesus. That sounds really good, and really hippie-ish, but it's really bad. Because what happens is you'll make Jesus in your own image. That's what you'll do. So what you need, but, but there's another error and there's another problem because just like you can say, let's just believe in Jesus, but let's not worry about the creeds and, and the beliefs of all that stuff. It's just, you know, doctrines divide. Jesus unites. Well, well, yes, doctrines divide because truth divides. You can't divorce Jesus from the creeds. But here's what I know. The tendency of us, especially within a orthodox evangelical church of just saying Jesus, no creeds, right? It's, that's not typical, but but there's an even greater danger is that we, we will grow up going to church week by week, Sunday by Sunday, and we will go through that list of five things and you can, you can sit there and you can look at those five doctrines and, and we can hear the truth and you, you can nod your head and say, uh-huh. And you can still be as lost as a pagan going to hell. What do I mean by that? When you divorce the creeds from the person of Jesus and just make your faith about mental assent to a list of doctrines, that's not salvation. The Bible teaches us that is, it is Jesus Christ, that God came. Remember the name that, that, that when God announced Jesus' birth, that he would be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. See, God is not just restoring humanity to what they should have been. He's restoring us to himself. And you can agree all you want with the right doctrine. If you do not know Jesus personally, you, I, would, I would ask yourself, yourself this question if you truly, your faith is genuine. I, I was, a number of weeks ago, I was meeting with someone from this church, and he had just gotten some, some severe uh, news about his health. And, and so, you know, reached out to me, and we, we got together, and we were having lunch and we were just talking about the, the struggle of, of him going through this news and what it meant for his family. And, and it, was a, it was a heavy time. And in that moment, I, all my best ideas come from God. God just gave me this thought. And I asked him this one question. If Jesus was sitting right here at the table, what's the question you would ask him? And he's like, man, that's a good question. We talked about that a little bit. And I've been using that I've been using that question a lot when I meet with people, both Christians and non-Christians, because I think all, both Christians and non-Christians, they can answer that question. If Jesus was sitting right here, what would you ask him? Because what that reveals about someone is what are their struggles? What are the things they're wrestling with? What are the things that they're questioning about life or about God? And, and so I was thinking about, that's a great question to ask, but, but I'm going to flip that question around. Because as I was thinking about that question this past week, there's, a, there's, there's another question. There's another scenario I want to paint for you. You're at the table. You're sitting there at the table today for, at lunch. And Jesus is sitting there. What's the question that he asks you? What's the question that Jesus asks you? I think the question that Jesus would ask you, the question he'd ask me, is this. Do you love me? Do you love me? Think about when he went to Peter after Peter's denial three times. And he goes to Peter and he just asks that simple question. Do you love me? Now, now, he's not asking that to Peter to make him feel guilty about what he did. He was actually in a restorative way. 
But that's the, at, at the heart of, of the relationship, that is what Jesus is asking you. And I, I think that's what the Spirit of God is maybe asking you right now. If God was to ask you that question, if Jesus was to sit there and ask you that question, how would you respond? If you're just kind of apathetic and empty inside? Or is there something stirring in you about that question? And the reason why you love Jesus is because you understand the fullness of what he did for you on the cross. Listen, my, my greatest fear as a pastor is to have a church full of people that think they are going to heaven, that think they are going to spend eternity with Jesus, but are just as lost as the pagans out there. Because there is no genuine personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Do not be deceived. Do not deceive yourself. If the Holy Spirit is pricking your heart right now because that's you, man, don't leave here today without talking to someone, without talking to me, without, without in your seat saying, Jesus, I need you and I want you. It's, you are more than just a list of doctrines. You are the Savior and the Lord of the universe. And I want you to be mine. That is what we need. That is what God wants. And so what Paul is addressing is this desertion, not just of a message, not just of doctrines, but of the person of Jesus Christ. Number three, there's only one gospel, there's only one way, there's only one Savior, and then lastly, there's only one to please. There's only one to please. Look at how he ends this, this verse, or this passage right here. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? If I, still, if I was still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. You see, what you've got to do when they have this thing called mirror reading of the scriptures to find out what's going on here. Paul is most likely using an argument that the Judaizers used against him. They probably, when they walked into the church and found out what was being taught, they said, well, listen, Paul didn't tell you the full gospel. He didn't tell you the full message of, of the teaching of, of, of God's word because it's hard, because God has high standards for us, because he knows it would be hard for you to be circumcised and to start obeying the Jewish laws. But we're here, we're here to tell you, we're not here to please man. We're just here to please God and make sure we're doing things biblically. And so Paul turns the argument on them. He says, I'm not trying to please men. I'm not trying to gain man's approval. They are. Because you have to think through the argument of what the Judaizers were thinking. Why did they care so much? Why did they care so much if a bunch of Gentiles that lived hundreds of miles away weren't observing the Sabbath or weren't being circumcised? Why did they care? They cared because they thought or they cared about what people thought about them. See, the Judaizers found themselves aligning with this Jesus movement. And they said, man, we want to be, we, we acknowledge that Jesus is the Messiah and we believe that, that he has come to, to be the fulfillment of, of, of the promises of the Old Testament. And they believe that. But the moment they heard that there are Gentiles in another city that are being converted and baptized and they're not having to observe the law, what they started hearing was from whispers in the synagogue and the other Jewish friends around them saying, wait a second, you're, is it true that your Jesus movement is, is not caring about the circumcision of people? If you really are worshiping this man as Messiah and they're not observing Torah, how can you say that? And all of a sudden, the Judaizers cared more about what their Jewish neighbors thought than what God thought. And this can happen to all of us, and it does happen to all of us. Because you know what? There is a people-pleasing side in every single one of us. There are times when people around us say, well, I can't believe anyone would believe that. And you're like, uh, I do. What do you do in those moments? Do you care more about the approval of people around you or do you care more about what God thinks? That is the fundamental question. I, by nature, I'm a people pleaser. I'm someone who you know, I'm a nine on the Enneagram, peacemaker. I don't like fighting. I don't like confrontation by nature. God has grown me incredibly, an incredible amount in, that, in those areas in my life um, because you can't be in ministry without having to confront people. It's just part of, part of it. But, you know, very early on, I remember I was a young man. 
He's 30 years old, planting this new church, and, and we're just trying to get this thing going. And when you're planting a new church, I mean, I was everything. You know, I'm leading a lot of different things, wearing a lot of different hats. I'm setting up in the morning, preaching, helping tear down, going home. I was leading youth one, I was leading the youth group at that time. And so I remember it was just a long Sunday, and we had the youth at our house, and I just got done. It was, and I was hungry, and there was this one kid that was not get mom had forgotten or had gotten the wrong time. And so this kid was at our house just waiting for the mom to pick him up. And so the mom comes in, and um, you know, she was she was a few fries short of a Happy Meal. She just wasn't, like, not normal. But she'd been coming to our church for a few weeks. And, you know, when you're a church planter, you're like, come, come all who are weary and heavy laden and come to our church and start tithing, please. Like, that is, that is what church planters are feeling. And so this girl, this, this woman comes in, and I'm eating dinner at the d- dinner table, and she just comes and sits right at the table and, she figures captive audience, and she just starts spouting off all these experiences and all these things and all these beliefs, and I'm just sitting there nodding, and it's crazy talk. I mean, she's just got some crazy, you know, TBN kind of beliefs, and it would just wasn't good. It wasn't right. And I'm, but I'm just sitting there, and I don't say anything. I just eat my food because I'm tired. So she, after about 30 minutes, she gets up, and she walks out of that door, and she shuts the door, and my wife comes over and looks at me and goes, what was that? I'm like, what? She's like, all the stuff she was saying, you just sat there. And I was like, yeah, I was hungry. Right? And, but, but really what it was, if, I, if I'm going to be honest with my own heart, what I really wanted is I didn't want to say something that would lose someone in my church. I cared, about, I cared about more people in my church than I cared about the truth of Jesus Christ and that person's soul. You see, that's what it comes down to. When you care more about what someone thinks, what you are saying is this, I care more about my comfort than the eternal destiny of that person. That's what you're doing. And what God wants us to do is he wants us to come to a place where we are we're not, we're not jerks, we're not offensive, but we are honest. And we're gracious in our honesty. I was reading, there's a great, there's a, there's a beautiful uh, devotional or prayer book. It's called The Valley of Vision. It's written by Puritans about 350 years ago. They've just collected a list of, of, of uh, poems and songs and prayers written for God. And I came across this phrase. It's called truth in Jesus. Truth in Jesus from the Valley of Vision. And it's, it's, it ends this prayer by saying this, teach me that Christ cannot be the way if I am the end, that he cannot be redeemer if I am my own savior, that there can be no true union with him while the creature has my heart, that faith accepts him as redeemer and Lord or not at all. That is the message that people need to hear today. Because there's a lot of people fooling themselves that think that they are saved or they are right with God and they are not. And they're your friends and they're your family and they're your neighbors. And what will you do when the opportunity comes to be courageous, to say something, to stand for the truth? There's only one gospel. Three questions, and then we're done. Number one, how, has your, how have your beliefs sh- been shaped by culture? You see you sitting there right now, all this talk of there's only one way. There's only one path that people can be wrong in their beliefs. Does that make you feel like, oh, but... Listen, don't, don't let the zeitgeist, don't let the waters you're swimming in in our culture, affect you more than the word of God. This is why we gotta be in it. This is why we gotta be reading it and and studying it and praying and letting this shape us more than anything else. How has culture shaped your beliefs? Number two, do you believe? Do you believe in the exclusivity of Jesus and his gospel? Remember the two things I'm praying that we leave here today with, and that is conviction and courage. 
And if anyone's walking in here that did not have the conviction about the, about the trueness of the gospel, my, my question to you is, do you believe in the exclusivity that's Jesus alone through faith alone? And if, you, if you're still cloudy about that or you're unsure about that, you need to talk to someone. You might have questions. It's okay to have questions. But don't leave those questions unanswered because your eternal destiny is at stake. And then lastly, number three, who are you living to please? Who are you living to please? Who is the one at the end of the day that influences you in what you say and how you say it? God is a God who cares that we please him more than man.